Some Sadducees, those who deny the resurrection, came forward and put this question to Jesus, saying, Teacher, Moses wrote for us, if someone's brother dies, leaving a wife but no child, his brother must take up the wife and raise up descendants for his brother. Now there were seven brothers. The first married a woman but died childless. The second and the third married her, and likewise all seven died childless. Finally, the woman also died. Now at the resurrection, whose wife will that woman be? For all seven had been married to her. Jesus said to them, the children of this age marry and remarry, but those who are deemed worthy to attain the coming age and to the resurrection of the dead neither marry or are given in marriage. They can no longer die. They are like angels, and they are the children of God because they are the ones who will rise. That the dead will rise, even Moses made known in the passage about the bush when he called out, Lord, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, he is not the God of the dead, but of the living. And for him, all are alive. Hello and welcome to Closer Walk Catholic Communications. I'm Father Bayer, your host, and we're glad that you can join us. You know, oftentimes, sacred scripture gives us little glimpses into life and life's habits and things we should or shouldn't do. Here's just a tip. Guys, if she's already killed off six husbands, don't fool with her, okay? Talk about the black widow. But obviously, the story is not about the black widow. The story is about afterlife. And there have been so many so many projections, so many jokes, so many stories. You know, the two guys who, you know, neighborhood friends and kids, they love baseball. They love baseball. They played it all in elementary school and high school and through college. And then, you know, they never missed a game. And their whole life was about baseball. They knew stats. They knew this. They knew that. And they made a pact. Whoever died, whoever died first would come back and give them some indication as to whether or not there's baseball in heaven, okay? And sure enough, Elmer died. And Harry's, you know, mourning the loss of his best friend. And that, you know, about a week later, Elmer appears to Harry in a dream. He said, Harry, he said, good news. You've never seen baseball like they've had baseball here in heaven. It's incredible. But he said, Harry, the bad news is you're pitching tomorrow, okay? And, you know, we have all these jokes about heaven and that sort of thing. And it's interesting the way, I don't know, I was a kid raised in Catholic schools, and, you know, they, they had artist conceptions of heaven, okay? Heavens was always a lot of bright lights, a lot of vertical lines, a lot of clouds, a lot of angels. All the angels were blonde-headed, okay? Being a little Lebanese kid, I didn't think they, I had a shot at it. But anyway, all the angels had, all, all, they all had blonde hair, okay? And hell, well, you know, hell was down there, and it was lots of fire and lots of horns and lots of pitchforks and, you know, and little goatees like Mitch Miller, you know, they had all that stuff and little goatees. And, and that was kind of our idea, you know, when we were, taught about our guardian angel, you know. Our guardian angel is one angel on one shoulder, you know, dressed like a little angel, a blonde, no doubt. You know, and the evil side of us was the little devil on our shoulder, you know, and that sort of thing. And we were told that's the way we we choose between right and wrong and all that stuff. Well, you know, what, what do we believe about heaven? And, you know, and, and the big four, we've heard about all of our life. Heaven, Herald, Purgatory, and Limbo. Well, you know, uh, no one's taken any pictures and emailed them back from heaven, okay? Don't have that capability. What we believe, what we believe about heaven 
is heaven is the realized presence of God. When you're in heaven, God is as visible and available as you are to whoever you're sitting watching this with. That's heaven. We know we're in the presence of God. And hell is a realized absence of God. And the realized absence of God is realizing there is a God. He's there. We can see him, but we can't get to him. If you remember the story in sacred scripture about uh, the rich man and Lazarus, you know, the, the Lazarus sat at the door begging for food. He threw him scraps from the table. The dogs used to come in and lick his sores. And, you know, they both die. And the rich man finds himself in the torments of hell. And he looks up and he sees God. He sees God and, it, and you know, in God's hand is Lazarus in the bosom. And he can't get to him because there's a great abyss that they talk about. And that, that really is the current theological understanding that the difference between heaven and hell is realized presence being available with God and hell being realized absence and how we get there. And there's the other little story about the, you know, you know the person who, um, who dies and makes it to heaven and everything and, you know, and so he, he gets to heaven and they show him heaven and they bring him to these two big doors and there's this beautiful banquet of just the finest foods anyone could ever want and I'm afraid that's a little bit more of my heaven than it should be, but anyway, and everyone's sitting around the ta table, they're happy, they're laughing, they're, they're, they're having a good time and he said, oh, God, thank God I made it. He said, but you know, I, I, I've lived in fear of going to hell all my life. He said, so, he said, hey, do you mind if I get to see what hell is like so I can just be so glad of what I missed? And they put him in the elevator, you know, take him down, you know, how the joke goes. But anyway, take him down, same type of doors, big room, beautiful table, and you know, same table as it was in heaven, and people sitting around the table just starving, emaciated, starving to death. He said, why is that with all this food? He said, well, see, here in, here in hell, the only thing you're allowed to eat with is 10-foot-long chopsticks. And by the time they get the chopstick and get the food to their mouth, it falls on the floor, and they're starving to death. Oh, that is hell. That's, that's horrible. So they get up to heaven, he goes in the room, he said, what are you allowed to eat with here in heaven? He said, 10 foot long chopsticks. He said, well, why? Why aren't they starving? He said, well, see, in heaven, they feed each other. And that's the difference. That's the difference. And that's how we account for that difference of heaven and hell, not only in the afterlife, but how we experience the presence of God in this world that ability to feed each other. And, you know, we don't have any, like I said, you know, no one's, no one's been there and come back. But there have been a number of things, you know, Ray Moody had a book, Life After Life, and a lot of people talk about dying and they were dead for two minutes or three minutes or something like that. And there was a bright light and there was a tunnel and everything like that. And this is not theological. Okay, but I'm going to tell you something I really believe. Uh, and that is, is uh, you know, I, I love that gospel when in, in Matthew's gospel, our Lord says, Come to me, all you who are weary and find life burdensome, and I will refresh you. The idea that we were refreshed and we're made whole and we we're made well in the presence of God. And there's a, there was a book out, I, I didn't see the movie, but, but I read the book. And the reason why I have a tendency to believe the book is because the book is told through the eyes of a four-year-old child. 
and there was a book called Heaven Can Wait. And it's a story of a little boy, full of typical little boy, little rage and terror. All of a sudden he comes in, he develops a fever, he gets sick, they take him to the hospital, got some bacteria, they don't think he's gonna live. They all have their community praying and you know, praying for this child and everything. And, and you know, for about 24 hours, it's just touch and go. He's gonna die any minute. He wakes up 24 hours later, He's hungry, back to his normal self, and never could figure out exactly what it was, what caused it. And so the kid comes home. And, you know, and he's just as bad as he ever was, you know, just as rambunctious. And, and he's starting to do things that are confusing his parents. And he, he comes in one day and he said, why didn't you give my little sister a name? What? Well, they had had a stillbirth daughter and had named it. You don't tell a four-year-old child you got a dead little sister, she wasn't born. He said, what are you talking about? Who told you that? She did. And she doesn't have a name. She wants a name. Okay, well, you know, he's four years old. Maybe that's the imaginary bear in the backyard. You know how kids are with their imaginations. And so he says, one day, the father's taking him out in the woods and they're going to shoot cans or whatever. They're out at the woods and he says, yeah, Papa used to take you out here. Well, Papa was his dad's grandfather, who was long dead before he was ever born. And he said, yeah. He said, who told you? He said, Papa did. Well, you know, okay. So anyway, they, they go and they do what they're going to do in the woods and they come back. And, and, and he's got a picture of his grandfather not long before he died. And he said, you know anybody here? He said, no. And kept playing, you know. He said a couple weeks later, they were over at, you know, his mother's house, who would have been, you know, uh, who would have been Papa's daughter, who had a picture of her dad right after he got out of the service on her dresser in the bedroom. He runs through the bedroom and goes, there's Papa. And he recognized this young man out of the service. That was Papa. What we know about heaven is realized presence. And in the, in being in the presence of God, we know there's no more sorrow, no more weeping, no more crying out, but only peace and joy in the presence of the Lord. <coughs> so that's what we trust in. That's what we trust in. In the presence of God, we're made well, we're made whole, and we trust in that presence that that's what the realized absence, I mean, that's what the realized presence is. And in, and in the sight of God, there's no more sorrow, no more weeping, no more crying out, no more pain. We're not sick. We're not old. Our bodies aren't riddled by cancer. We're not feeble. We're not crippled anymore. We're in the presence of God. And come to me, all you who are weary and find life burdensome, and I will refresh you. The Scripture has given us a little glimpse into the reality of heaven. And the other big three that we were taught about as kids is heaven, hell, purgatory, and limbo. You have an update on uh, limbo, purgatory, and hell when you get back. Stay with us. We'll be back in a moment. Hi, I'm Father Jeff Bay from Closer Walk Catholic Communications. Thank you for being here today. And a special thanks for the support that you give us. First of all, your prayerful support we so desperately need. And also your financial support. We are donor-driven, and that would, is what keeps us on the air today. As you well know, the truth is in great demand and in very short supply, and mainstream media is not going to bring you the truth of the Gospels of our Lord Jesus Christ because that's not socially acceptable and it's not politically correct. Certainly, we all realize that when this life journey is over, we don't stand before the Supreme Court. We stand before the throne of God. Therefore, with great clarity and great charity, to pronounce the truth of the gospel is important. Your prayers, your financial support enables us to do that. So we thank you and may God bring you closer in your walk with the Lord each day. God bless you. Jesus said to them, the children of this age marry and remarry, but those who are deemed worthy to attain the coming age and the resurrection of the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage. They can no longer die, 
for they are like angels, and they are children of God, because they are the ones who will rise. Hello and welcome back to Close Walk Catholic Communications. Father Byer, your host, we're glad that you can join us. You mean my husband's not going to be my husband in the next life? My wife's not going to be my wife in the next life? A lot of people would find that very upsetting. And one of the things, part of Catholic theology, is, is that the sacrament of marriage is, is so that we can assist each other on our journey to eternal life and spend eternal life together. No one is saying you can't be with them for eternal life. What it's saying is, is that the marriage deal in heaven is not what, is, is, is not how heaven is constructed because we're not going to have these bodies in heaven. And if we do, I want to be skinny in the next life, okay? But we're not going to have these bodies in heaven. It's going to be more of a spiritual existence, all right? And the realization is, is that we will spend eternity together. Now, I'm going completely off the radar, okay? But I have been, I was in Cajun country for a long time, and things are a little bit different when you live in a rural life. People are dying. They don't rush them to the hospital. Hospital not going to do them any good. They're going to die in their own bed. And a lot of the people out there, their first language was Cajun. And I mean, Cajun French. And so all of a sudden, on their deathbed, they'll resort to speaking in French. But the interesting thing is, is they'll start talking to dead people. They'll start talking to their grandpa, they'll start talking to their grandma, they'll start talking to special people in their life. And people say stuff like, oh, they, they're losing their mind, they're hallucinating. I don't believe that. I really believe that sometimes people come for us. I believe that. This is not a theological definition official teaching of the Catholic Church. Please understand that. But I've had enough instances and I've watched it. I mean, these people have all been comatose. And all of a sudden it's like someone jolts them and they, they, they're babbling. They've been non-responsive and they're babbling. They're babbling in French and they're talking to their grandmother, their, their grand, somebody. And they die not long after. And all of a sudden, there's a great peace about it. Which brings up another, uh, another situation. And that is about the sacrament of the sick. A lot of times, people believe that, you know, we, we were raised, we called it extreme unction. We called it the last rites. And so we thought you could only receive that once in your life. And right when you're about ready to die, you know, you do a buzzer beater and you call the priest. We have realized that the sacraments are for the living, not for the dead. And so we bring the living the sacraments so that they, they can be assisted and either comforted and healed or comforted in their passage, okay? So a lot of times I encourage my people, if you have serious surgery, Come for the sacrament of reconciliation, I'm, I'm for the sacrament uh, of the sick. We don't call it extreme unction in the last rites. I'll go in hospitals a lot of time, and people, you know, they're elderly, they're not real clear. I don't want to say, hey, I'm going to give you the last rites. It scares them, you know. If you're like someone hadn't told me anything and I'm dying, so how about if I pray with you and give you this special anointing, the sacrament of the sick? It's the same thing. And people are scared to call the priest. You know, my experience is, is that when you receive the sacrament of the sick, the grace of the sacrament brings great comfort, great healing, whether you're sick or dying, it brings great comfort. So please, don't wait till 2.30 in the morning and hospice says you'll be dead in the next half hour. Now's the time to call the priest. Don't do that. First of all, we don't have as many priests around as we used to, and you'll be very upset if you wait till the last half hour and someone's not available or someone didn't get the call or 
your priest happens to be out of town and someone's taking their place. So make the sacrament of the sick part of chronic conditions, part of serious surgery, and receive the sacraments of the sick, you know, with some regularity. You know, I hope you don't have a long-suffering death. But if you're a certain age and you want to receive the sacraments, tell Father, I'd like to be anointed. And, and it's wonderful. You know, if you're able to, you ask to go to confession, then receive the sacrament of the sick. Uh, but the words of the anointing, Lord our God, you tell us through the Apostle James that if they're sick among you, let them send for the priests of the church. Let the priests pray over them, anointing them with oil. This prayer made in faith will save the sick person. If they have committed any sins, they will be forgiven them. So if someone is unconscious and the priest goes and anoints them, they get absolution. It's like an easy pass for heaven, okay? It's God's mercy and God's forgiveness through the sacrament. And now that we're preparing ourselves to death, we, what have happened to limbo? What was limbo? We're always told that if a baby's unbaptized and that dies, they go to limbo. It wasn't up, it wasn't down, it was kind of a big suspended playpen in the galaxy. We didn't know where it was, okay? And obviously at this point, the teaching of the church is no longer talking about limbo. What we believe is for those unbaptized babies, and obviously through no fault of their own, they too are descendants of David, okay? We believe in God's mercy and compassion, and, and the unbaptized are with God uh, because of God's mercy and compassion. We believe that especially now since how many millions of children have been aborted. You know, obviously those, those aborted babies are the holy innocents. You know, those are the ones who've been slain. And so certainly God's mercy and compassion takes us to himself. Uh, so limbo is not really taught or emphasized today. Now, what about purgatory? Now, first of all, where does purgatory come from in the scriptures? Well, you're going you're gonna to realize that in the Protestant Reformation, when uh, Martin Luther said, Scriptura sola, only scripture, and the church says scripture and tradition, and then they say, well, what's the difference between the Catholic Bible and a Protestant Bible. Well, the Protestant Bible has eliminated some of the books of the Bible. And one of the books that has been eliminated is from the Old Testament, the book of Maccabees. And in the book of Maccabees, they speak about King Maccabee, who had gone into war with his troop and lost thousands of men. In his grief and in his sorrow, he started offering up prayers and offerings for the souls of those people who had been lost under his command. And so in the book of Maccabees, we find that it is good and necessary to pray for the dead. Well, we believe about purgatory. Well, purgatory comes from the Latin word Purgatio. Purgatio means to cleanse. In English, we talk about purging things. If you've ever had, you know, seafood of a certain type, and before you cook it, they put it in salt water, and in the salt water, it eliminates all the impurities from, from within it, and it regurgitates it, and now that they're cleansed, now that they're ready to be eaten. So, Purgatio is a cleansing a cleansing that takes place. And people say, well, you know, I, I don't think that that's necessary. Well, we get that in our Catholic theology from the book of Maccabees, which will not be found in a Protestant, a Protestant Bible. But the second thing is, how many of us believe that after our life on earth, be it one day or a hundred years, that I've lived my life good enough to deserve to be in the presence of God. Do you re does anyone really think you're a shoe in 
Do you really think you're that good that God deserves to have someone like you? And when I get there, the price of real estate in heaven's going to go up. I mean, what's going on here? You know, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. We spoke about last week. That's the understanding that all of us will have an opportunity because none of us can be found worthy of God because he was a man like us in all things but sin. And a lot of us have gotten that sin thing down pretty good and we do it regularly, okay? And so that understanding is, is that we are granted by God's love and by God's mercy and opportunity between the end of this life and the fullness of the resurrection, God allows us a time to be purged, to be purified, and to be found worthy to fully be in the last resurrection and be in the presence of God. And how long that lasts, I have no idea. But purgatory is a sign of God's mercy and a sign of God's love. I pray for purgatory, okay? I pray that I'm going to be found worthy for purgatory, which means God is not going to be finished with me yet. I was born a sinner. I'm going to die a sinner. I don't know how much I'm going to have to pay for, but hope God is merciful and gives me that opportunity for that purification, that purging to take place at the end of this life to be found worthy of the fullness of God and the last resurrection. So for people who think that's kind of like Catholic mumbo jumbo purgatory, God, that's Catholic mercy. That's Catholic hope. That's, you know, that's a great understanding of the knowledge of God's love and mercy and desire for us and a willingness for God to take us to his own. And then hell. You know, hell is our, it's our rejection of God. It's our rejection of God. Since we're talking about heaven, hell, purgatory, and limbo, I thought I'd throw in a little commercial. So one of the difference between heaven and hell depends on how we vote. And everyone's got to vote their conscience, but it's really important that our faith is under attack now. Religious liberties are under attack now. And it's, gonna, it's going to have a great influence on our freedom of worship in years to come. So what I would like to ask you to do, as you go to the polls, before you get there, you need to understand who these people are, what they stand for. Not are they good for your insurance business or good for your medical business or good for, for the oil business. Are they good for religious liberties and freedoms in this country? It's a very difficult challenge, but it's a challenge we must make. We must vote. We must vote for those who will give us the freedom to remain faithful to the law of God. Our nation depends on it. Thank you again, and God bless.